Uh, welcome everyone. So today it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Hugo Yu. And Hugo is currently a postdoc working with Danena and Hugo got his PhD from Cornell University working with Jack Kaufman, right? That's, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. And working on a lot of high dimensional statistical problem and statistical learning problem and like multi-view data. And today he's going to talk about the reluctant interaction modeling. So let's welcome Hugo. Uh, thank you, Enchi, for the introduction. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to present my work today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about reluctant interaction modeling. Um, this is a joint work with, uh, this is basically work in my graduate study, and this is a joint work with my uh, PhD advisor, Jacob Bien, who is now at the University of Southern California, and our collaborator, Ryan Tiptrani at Carnegie Mellon. Um, this is Aristotle. He's obviously not our collaborator, but uh, he once said that the world, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, which hopefully motivates, in some sense, the study of interactions. So today I'm going to first talk about the study of interactions um, by using a motivating uh, data example, which is the TripAdvisor data sets. So I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have some experience with TripAdvisor or a similar website, uh, which on this website, you get access to the information of a lot of hotels and the ratings or the reviews of these hotels by um, customers from all over the world. For example, I just, today I just randomly select one profile of a hotel, which is the Graduate Seattle Hotel on Brooklyn Avenue. Um, so it seems like I randomly pick one uh, review from this hotel, which gets a very good review. And this re review contains a lot of very positive words. For example, nice, uh, favorite, wonderful, close, easy, fun, good, nice, helpful. When you see all these positive words describing this hotel, you usually expect that this hotel has a very high rating. And in this case, Associated with the reviews, there's a five out of five rating, which is the perfect rating. So as a statistician, I am wondering if I can build a model to predict this rating of the hotel based on the word used in these reviews. So an oversimplified, hopefully not too simplified model is this linear model where the response is just a rating on the scale of one to five where the features that I'm using is just, if I construct a bag of words, then for each word on this bag of words, I just look at whether this word appears in this review. So this, this, the feature that I'm using is just a binary variable indicating whether a word appears in this review. Of course, not all hotels are doing as good job as a graduate Seattle. This is a review of another hotel which contains actually a lot of very negative words like avoid, worst, terrible, dirty, broken, and helpful, rude. When you see words like this, you don't usually expect a high rating of this hotel. And in this case, indeed, <coughs> excuse me, this, this hotel receives a one out of five rating, which is really bad. It is reasonable to think that this model was to do a fairly good jobs in capturing the relationship between the response of interest and the features that we're using here. <coughs> However, as I keep looking at the reviews of hotels, I found some very interesting reviews. For example, this is a, ho this is a hotel review where I noticed words like worst and unpleasant, which are highly negative words and usually regarded as a signal for a very low rating of the hotel. However, this hotel surprisingly gets a five out of five, which is a perfect rating. So what is happening? Well, um, a more careful examination of this, re this review shows that actually there are some certain interactions between word used in this review that are actually um, important. For example, in this review, there are interactions between worst and but, and there are interactions between except and unpleasant. So the interactions like this will totally change the originally negative meaning of the words like worse and unpleasant. 
And that means that shows that actually, in addition to all these words that are used in this, in this review, it is sometimes helpful to include the pairwise interactions of all these words. Remember that the word, the original features that we're using are indicator of whether or if a word is used in this review. So their interactions is whether both words appear in this review. So this is the pairwise interaction model that I'm gonna consider to study in this project. And I'm gonna just write it um, as um, this in a general form where the response of interest Y depends not only on the main effects, which is linear combinations of features used X and beta, but also the interactions, the pairwise interactions of all these main effects. The coefficient beta stars are the coefficient in, um, corresponding to the main effects and gamma stars are the coefficient corresponding to all the pairwise interactions. And you might wonder why is that really different from a, main, uh, from a linear model in main effects? because what we can really do is just we set ZJK as just interactions between J and K, then this is really nothing different from another linear model in X and Z. And indeed, that, and indeed if we wanna do like a variable selection, then what we can do is just fit a lasso on, on this large problem. And indeed, this is one of the methods there we're considering, which is what we call the all pairs lasso, which run a large lasso problems on all the main effects and the constructed all pairs interactions. And we consider this method, the all pairs lasso, as our baseline methods to compare. Well, that seems to be the end of the story because that's also everything that we're, we care about. But immediately, we are facing two problems or two challenges. The first one is computational challenge. If we denote Q as the total numbers of variables in this large lasso problems, then this Q equal to P plus P choose two, where P is the numbers of main effects and P choose two is the total number of pairwise interactions. So this total number of variables in this lasso problems grows quadratically with P, the numbers of main effects. In this TripAdvisor data example, if we construct a bag of words of over 7,800, that means we have, we're about 7,800 7, main effects, then we'll start talking about about 30 million parameters. And of course, um, in this data set, we're actually considering more than 200,000 reviews. That means if we just construct this huge augmented design matrix containing all the main effects and the interactions, then we're talking about a storage of over 140 gigabytes. And that is already be considered presenting this matrix in a sparse representation, assuming 99% nine of this large matrix is sparse. So it seems to be a very, very hard computational problem. Moreover, even if we can get past of this computational challenge, there are something intrinsically different. The conceptual challenge says that actually interactions should be treated differently from the main effects because there are a lot more of the interactions than the main effects. And also because we, um, usually the inter interactions are harder to interpret than main effects. Interaction model is never an old problem in statistical literature. And there has been a lot of uh, papers written in trying to model interactions. So a very popular way of, of solving these two types of com computational and conceptual challenge is by putting some constraints on the structures of interactions. And among all these assumptions, hierarchy assumptions, usually also called heredity assumptions, is the most popular one. So this hierarchy assumption says that an interaction is only relevant if the corresponding main effects is relevant. Equivalently, that means if there are certain main effects that is irrelevant, that means any interaction that are made up by this main effects is irrelevant and we should not care about that interactions at all. I do not intend to exhaust the list of literature that are built upon this hierarchy assumption, but there are really a lot of papers on this. Well, this hierarchy assumption is really helping us 
because it greatly reduced the search space of interactions and also it makes a clear distinction between main effects and interactions. So that both simultaneously that solves the computational and conceptual challenge presented earlier. Of course, I wish that this hierarchy assumption always holds, but in practice, you know, it is assumption, so it can, uh, it, it can fail. A very simple example is, consider, is by considering the response of interest as whether I cannot see or not. And I'm considering two main effects. The first one is whether I close my left eye. The other, the other main effect is whether I cannot close, uh, whether I close my right eye. So obviously whether I cannot see or not does not depend marginally on whether I close my left eye or right eye. It only depends on whether I close both of my eyes. So this is an example where none of the main effects is relevant to the response but their interaction is relevant to the response. And this is an example that shows that hierarchy assumption fails. So in, in this talk, we're trying to ask, answer this question, which is, can we enjoy the benefits of hierarchy assumption without actually assuming hierarchy? And the answer to that question is yes, by our methods that we call Sprinter, and our methods is built upon a new principle that we call the reluctance principle. We call it a principle, but it actually sounds really simple. So the reluctance principle is saying that one should prefer a main effect over an interaction if all else is equal. I will talk a little bit more about what specifically would mean prefer a main effect over an interaction and what, what would mean if all else is equal. To do so, let me start with a guiding principle to show what it means of the reluctance pr uh, principle. Um, so this example is an example of two main effects where both of the main effects are binary. So the response depends on the indicator of some random events E1, some indicator of uh, some random events E2 and their interactions. Because both of the main effects are just indicator of binary variable, their interaction is just the indicator of the intersection of the two events. Consider a setting where with high probability, E1, the first events, implies E2. So in this case, given some realization of both main effects, that means that it means that um, their interaction or the intersection of the two events is really nothing too different from the, uh, from the indicator of the first events or the smaller events. So in this case, this interaction can be well explained by just the main effects and we can rewrite this model as a main effects only model by, con by, uh, by combining the effects of the first main effects with the interaction. So this is an example where we have two models that, that explain the response well, e approximately well enough equally. And the reluctance principle is saying that in this case, I'm preferring the main effects only model to the model with an interaction. To see it in a more general setting, let's uh, denote the Z as the vector containing all the pairwise interactions. So my original model, the pairwise interaction model, Y can be written as the linear combinations of the main effects, which is the main effect signal, and the linear combinations of all the pairwise interaction as the interaction signal, plus some random error that is assumed to be independent of everything else. Because we don't assume any um, assumptions on the correlation structures between the main effects and the interactions, Usually, we, we see that there could be an overlap between the main effect signal and the interaction signal. So the reluctance principle is saying that we're trying to capture as much as possible of this overlap part of the signal by using only the main effects part. So we're building a new linear combinations of the main effects, which we call X terms of theta star, and we call it the best main effects predictor. And so what's left over in the original interaction signal is what we call the pure interaction signal. In other words, we re-parameterize the original model 
and write it as a new linear combination of the main effects and construct a new set of interaction. So, the, so, the, so these two models are equivalent and the reluctance principle is preferring the second model. I wanna note uh, two things. The first one is that we're just using the original main effects model, uh, the main effects, but we're constructing a new linear combination. So the coefficient in terms of the main effects are different, changing from beta star to theta star. But for the interaction part, we're actually constructing a new set of interaction that we call W, where the coefficients are different. Another thing that I wanna mention is this W, or this newly constructed set of interactions, are constructed only for theoretical or the conceptual understanding of these methods. In practice, we never need to actually construct this W. In practice, all we need is just Z, or the original interaction. To understand this process of capturing most of the signal of the overlap by main effects uh, from a, a geometric point of view, let's consider this giant um, vector space of random variable, where this great shaded area is a subspace spanned by all the linear combinations of the main effects. And to get rid of the random error, I'm just uh, equivalently writing my original model in terms of the expectation of y given x as the linear combinations, of, uh, as a summation of two parts of the signal, x transpose beta star as a linear, uh, as the main effect signal that lies in this great shaded area because it is a uh, linear combination of the main effects. And also my target uh, signal can be written as a vector summation of this main effect signal and the interaction signal, Z transpose gamma star. So the reluctance principle is saying that I want to capture as much as possible the variability in the response by only using the linear combinations of the main effects. So that is really just the solution to the following arc main problem. Geometrically, that means I'm just projecting my response onto the column space or the, the subspace spanned by all the linear combinations of the main effects. What's left over, which is the orthogonal projection, is what we call the pure interaction signal. By the properties of the orthogonal projection, we know that actually this W transpose gamma star is orthogonal to any linear combinations of the main effects. And that is in the sense that we call it the pure interaction where orthogonal meaning that W transpose gamma star is, has zero correlation with any part or any linear combinations of the main effects. Okay. All right, so in this case, we can just rewrite it the, the rewrite the original signal as X transpose theta star plus W transpose gamma star. And to give a brief review of what we're trying to say in the previous slides, we start with the main effects signal and interaction signal that has potentially some overlap. And we're just rewriting it equivalently as a summation of best main effects predictor and pure interaction signal. And now they have no um, overlap. Great, so that is basically the intuition behind the reluctance principle. And guided by this reluctance principle, we design our methods as a three steps methods. In the first step, our methods really honors this reluctance principle by capturing as much signal as possible with only main effects. In step two, we're doing a screening or an interaction screening by just making one single pass over all interactions Computationally, we, it is easy for us because we never need to store all of the interaction. We just look at interaction one at a time. Finally, given some set of selected interaction in step two, we fit a refined model on the main effects and the selected interaction from step two to get a refined model as our final model. And our method is, is called Sprinter that stands for sparse reluctant interaction modeling. And another reason that we call it Sprinter is because it runs really fast. <clears throat> Concretely, our Sprinter algorithm consists of the following three steps. In the first steps, we're running a lasso or any other similar regularized regression model of the response on the main effects only. 
and then we get the residual from this fit. In step two, we're doing an interaction screening process by just screening interactions based on the correlation of each interaction with the residual from step one. And with, after the screening step, we get a set of selected interaction that we call a hat. Finally, in step three, we run a lasso of the response on all the main effects and the selected interactions. And we're gonna talk about each step separately to better understand them. We start with step one, where we're running a lasso on all the main effects. So, the re so that, saves, uh, th that solves the following L1 penalized regression problems. And then you might wonder that uh, in this case, we're just fitting the response um, by using the main effects. So we're totally ignoring the interactions. Would well, that gives us a really good fit? Well, recall that by this projection argument, we can always write this res response as the, the summation of the best main effects predictor X, times X theta star plus pure interaction signal W gamma star. So in step one, what we're really doing is trying to estimate this theta star, which is the coefficient in terms of the best main effects predictor. And because of the construction, X and W, or the main effects and the pure interactions, has zero correlation. So we can treat everything else, W gamma star plus epsilon, as a new random error with possibly higher variance. So that would give us a minimal effects or side effects in using just the main effects in this step one lasso problem. Step two is a screening <coughs> procedure by just looking at each interaction and compute the sample correlation of this interaction with the residual from step one and see whether the absolute value correlation is greater than some tuning parameter eta. On one extreme, when the tuning parameter eta is zero, that means I really want to take any interaction into my model. So that gives me an A hat that is everything possible. On the other extreme, when eta equal to infinity, that means I really don't want to take any interactions at all. So in this case, A hat is just empty set. In particular, if let's say M interactions are selected from this step two, then the total number of computation is big O of P squared N plus P squared log M, where P squared N is the total number of computation required to compute the correlation of each interaction with the residual. P squared log M is the total number of computation required to maintain the top M interaction that has the largest correlation with the residual. And the goal here is to attain a small set, a hat that captures most of the pure interaction signal, W transpose gamma star. Finally, once we get this a hat as the selected set of interaction, we just run another lasso problems of all the main effects and the selected interaction as this following uh, penalized L1 penalized regression problem. Now let me just finish this table by looking at the two extremes of values of eta that is used in step two. When eta equals zero and we just include any possible pairwise interaction, this step three is really just the all pairs lasso, which is the benchmark methods that we're trying to compare with. As we were saying, the computation for all pairs lasso is really bad. But the prediction is fairly good because it could, it has all the pairwise interaction that we could possibly consider into the model. On the other extreme, when eta equal to infinity and we don't select any part of the interactions into the model, we call this method the main effects lasso because it just run a lasso on the main effects. It is extremely computationally efficient because there's only P, there are only P main effects considered in this lasso problem, but it is not very good in terms of prediction because it totally ignores the information from the interactions. In terms of the storage used, if M interactions are chosen in step two, then the total number of storage needed is just big O of N times P plus M, which is the size of the design matrix that we need to pass into this final 
lasso step. Next, I'm going to talk about some theoretical analysis of the Sprinter algorithm. And this method, uh, this, this theoretical analysis is built upon a very general model assumptions where we draw an IID samples from this, mod, uh, this pairwise interaction model where the main effects are sub mean, uh, zero mean sub Gaussian random variables. Some random error epsilon is sub Gaussian with, uh, uh, with variance sigma squared and is independent of everything else. And we make some assumptions on the scale of the ambient dim dimension P and the numbers of observations n. So before I directly jump into the results of the theoretical analysis, I want to ask one question, which is, uh, of course, uh, I, uh, another thing that I want to mention is here, I don't make any assumptions on the, uh, on the correlation structures between X and Z. So they can be arbitrary dependent structure. But, be, but by this uh, projection argument, we can always equivalently write that as X transpose theta star plus W transpose gamma star, where X and, Z, X and W, which is the main effects and the pure interaction, are zero, have zero correlation. Okay, so back to my original uh, earlier question, which is what are the interaction or what is the set of interaction that we really care about in this theoretical analysis? Well, a standard answer to that question by which is used by all the previous interaction uh, literature is saying, oh, the set of interactions that I'm really care about are the set of, are the support of gamma star or the set of interaction whose corresponding coefficients are non-zero. I'm gonna show in the next a couple of slides that this is not necessarily the case in our framework. Let's actually consider this binary main effects example again, where previously we show this example and the response can be equally well written as a main effects only model. Here, I'm just right that as just a realization of 10 observations where this response can be written as just main effects plus their uh, actual interaction, but they can also be equally well written as some interactions and the pure interaction where the coefficient in terms of the main effects are different, where the coefficient in, in terms of the main effects are written as this, which is the new, a, a new a linear combinations of the main effects using our projection uh, arguments. So in this case, in the second model of the response, the interaction signal is really nothing but zero or very close to zero. In that case, this interaction is really irrelevant and we don't care about it, even if the coefficient in front of this interaction, gamma star, is non-zero. So this is basically the takeaway message from the theoretical analysis of Sprinter, which is our target set of interaction is not necessarily the support of gamma star, the coefficient of interactions. Okay, so we're saying our target set is not necessarily support of gamma star. What is that exactly? Well, we define our target set of interaction as a solution to the following constraint maximization problem. Where I'm gonna, although this looks a little bit complicated and math heavy, so I'm gonna talk about the, the two parts differently. I'm gonna start talking about the constraint part of this constraint maximization problem first, where we're saying our target set should be a set that captures enough of the pure interaction signal. Where we rigorously define what we call enough of the pure interaction signal as saying that our, our target set is an alpha important set, meaning that the expectation or equivalently, if we consider like the variance of the pure interaction signal constrained to complement of this set is at most alpha. Recall that this, this is the part of the poor pure interaction which gets one part bitten by the main effects. We're saying that our target set A captures is an alpha important set if it captures all but alpha of the pure interaction signal. Okay. 
All right. So our target set is first, it should be an alpha important set. But it is actually a special, special alpha important set in, in the sense that it is the most easily detected alpha important set. In the sense that it attains the largest signal strength where we define our signal strengths as the minimum value for each interaction in signal, the absolute value of correlation of this interaction with the pure interaction signal W transpose gamma star. This might sound or looks a little bit too complicated, but to understand it better, let's recall what we're doing in step two. In step two, we're straining interactions based on the absolute correlation with with the residual from step one, where the residual can actually be written as this, where in step one, we're just trying to fit this theta star by getting the last estimate theta hat. So if step one is doing a really good job, then this first part of the R can be controlled to be a small, um, a small quantity. So what's left over in this residual is really just the pure interaction signal W gamma star. So comparing this left side and right side, we see that actually we're defining the signal strengths as the population version of what we're really using in step two. So if that, if that signal strength is really large, that means that part of the signal can be well recovered by our step two. And this valve alpha um, is really plays is really playing a role as a theoretical tuning parameter in our theoretical analysis. To give some concrete examples of values of alpha and correspondingly um, our target set of interactions, in this previous binary uh, main effects example, if alpha equal to zero, <coughs> that means intuitively we really don't allow any part of the pure interaction to be left unexplained. In other words, that means our gamma, gamma star sub, sub to the complement of A has to be zero, assuming uh, if the pure interaction sub to the complement of, of this target set is non-zero almost surely. In other words, that means our target set is the support of gamma star. Well, that is an extreme case where alpha equal exactly to zero. But if alpha is approximately zero, but not exactly zero, in this case, all we need is that this is, <clears throat> we just allow only a small tiny part of the pure interaction signal to be left unexplained. So in this case, gamma star sub A complement is not necessarily the support of gamma star. It does, so gamma, gamma star sub A complement is not necessarily all zero. If W sub A of complement has very small variance. On the other extreme, if alpha equal to infinity, that means I really don't care any part of the pure interaction signal left unexplained. So in this case, this is really an unconstrained, so our target set is just defined in terms of the unconstrained maximization problem, meaning that we don't really care about any part of the pure interaction signal. In this case, intuitively, our target set is just an empty set because I, I really don't want any part of the signal from the interactions. Mathematically, that also gives us the empty set from this um, constraint maximization problem because the minimization over empty set is infinity, infinity which attains the maximization in this problem. So in general, this theoretical tuning parameter alpha plays a role that gives us a better understanding of um, the, the trade-off between computation and prediction. If the larger the value of alpha means that the larger portion of the pure interaction signal that we can allow to be ignored. So let's consider th the spectrum of the value of alpha where on the left-hand side, alpha equal to zero, in this case, we don't allow any part of the interactions to be left unexplained. This gives us a very good prediction. On the other extreme, when alpha equal to infinity, our target set is just empty. 
and we don't really care about any part of the interaction, that leads to a very bad prediction. In the other dimension, in terms of the computation, however, things got reversed, where when alpha equivalent infinity, we want to capture as much interaction as possible, sorry, alpha equivalent zero, we want to capture as much uh, interaction as possible, that gives us a very hard computational problem. On the other extreme, when alpha equivalent infinity, we don't care about any interaction. So this problem is very easy in terms of computation. Our main theoretical uh, result says that our methods with the carefully chosen value of eta in step two can attain a good trade-off between computation and prediction. In particular, if our target, uh, if our tuning parameter eta lies between eta star, which is the noise level of the problem, and eta of a of alpha, which is the signal strength of the target set, then with high probability, Spinter can achieve the following several uh, properties. The first one is that this target set of interaction is contained in a hat of eta, which is the set of interaction that we select from step two. In other words, we're not missing any important interaction that we really care about. Moreover, we can show that our, the size of the selected interaction from step two has an upper bound, meaning that our methods can attain certain computational efficiency. In many examples, in many concrete examples, we show that the size of a hat is strictly uh, a small o of p squared, meaning that our methods is strictly co more computationally efficient than the all pairs lasso. Finally, taking certain value of uh, lambda, which is a tune parameter in step three, our methods can have the following prediction, uh, pre prediction error, where the prediction error is corresponding to the lasso's uh, problem in step three. And uh, in some concrete examples, we show that this, co uh, this computational, uh, sorry, this prediction accuracy is comparable to that of the Alpers lasso. So in summary, we show theoretically that our methods is, is computationally more efficient than all pairs lasso while attaining the same, uh, the same prediction uh, accuracy or the same prediction error bound. Finally, let me uh, get some empirical studies to show um, the practical performance of the sprinter methods. I'm gonna first uh, talk about some simulation results where I'm comparing our methods with the all pairs lasso in terms of both computational time and mean uh, squared prediction error. We show that actually our methods are way more efficient than all pairs lasso. Uh, in particular, when P equal to 2000, our methods is about 100 times faster than all pairs lasso. And Given uh, all this um, favorable computational performance, our methods attains as good, if not better, the predictive accuracy than all pairs lasso. Um, as a really large example, we show that our uh, methods can solve a problem of size 140,000, which means uh, main effects, which is about 10 billion interaction under seven hours on my own CPU, one a single CPU, and this is with five cro uh, five-fold cross-validation to select the tuning parameters in step three. And I love to revisit this TripAdvisor data set, where we're considering more than two hundred thousand reviews, and we're constructing a bag of words that contains uh, more than seven thousand eight hundred distinct words. Most of them are adjectives. So in this case, we, uh, the P, which is the number of main effects, is just uh, more than 7,800. 7, so that means if we consider all the pair interaction, we have about 30 million interactions. And the main effects that we're considering are just binary features indicating whether um, J's word appears in the ICE review. And our goal is just to predict the rating of Y or a predict the rating of, the, uh, of a hotel on a scale of one to five based on the words used in the ICE review. So here are some test set um, root mean squared error of uh, several methods. 
The first method that we're comparing is the main effects lasso, which totally ignores the interaction. Comparing this with the sprinter, which is our methods, it shows the importance of including all the pairwise interaction into the model. Two-stage hierarchical lasso is a method that requires two stages. In the first stage, uh, it solves a lasso on all the main effects. And on all the selected main effects by the lasso, it considers all the interactions. So this is the method that attains this hierarchical structure. Still, it attains worse uh, test set uh, root mean squared prediction error than Sprinter that shows that the true uh, interaction structures in this data sets is not necessarily hierarchy. And finally, we're also doing a, a short independent screening lasso over the Sprinter where short independent screening lasso doesn't really put any preference over main effects over interactions where ours does. So the slight difference in terms of the prediction accuracy shows that possibly uh, it is uh, beneficial in using this reluctance principle. And all pairs lasso as our benchmark problem of uh, methods uh, find this problem too big to solve. So it is basically impossible to run all pairs lasso in such a big or large scale problem. It is actually very interesting to look at all the uh, recovered um, coefficient estimates by the sprinter on this data sets. In total, uh, there are more than 1,000 main effects selected by our methods, and I'm just presenting the top five positive and negative main effects, and there's corresponding coefficient. And they all make perfect sense. Positive words, the most positive main effects are excellent, fantastic, perfect, wonderful, love. The most negative main effects are worst, horrible, terrible, dirty, awful, which make perfect sense. However, the things are way more interesting if we start looking at uh, the selected top five positive interactions and top five negative interactions. The top, let's say the worst and not, is the most positive interaction, which makes a lot of sense given this motivating example as we have seen in the start of this talk. And disappointing but is also in the similar flavor. However, if you look at, for example, the most negative interaction, then that is the interaction between wonderful and superb. And excellent and superb are also very negative. Great, awesome, great, fantastic. They're all very negative interactions. So, so what is really happening here? If we just look at this interaction, wonderful and superb, they have the corresponding coefficient negative uh, 0.158. If you look at their corresponding main effects in this model, both of the wonderful and superb have the main effects coefficient that is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So if you write, write out the model um, and just looking at these three terms, it seems like that makes a lot of sense because if I tell you that a, mod, uh, that a hotel is both wonderful and superb, that doesn't really make it twice as good as I just, call, I just tell you that it is wonderful. So the interactions between wonderful and superb gives like this, uh, this regression effects of the additive effects from both wonderful and superb. And we call it the diminishing returns of the superlative synonym. And of course, um, worse than not, is sort of the interactions that uh, we, uh, we expect to see from the output of Sprinter, where both not and worst have negative uh, coefficient and their interaction is positive. An example is from a rating that says, due to the problem with other hotels when customers arrive late, I was fearing the worst. However, we had not problem at all and it gets a perfect five out of five rating. You might think that this review has, does a terrible job in terms of grammar. So I have another example that is an interaction between worst and but, and the review is saying, excellent air, airport hotel, we awoke in the morning to snow and fear the worst, but everything was fine. And it also has a rating of five out of five. In summary, on a spectrum of predictive models, on the one extreme, we have this highly interpretable but very simple structured linear model. On the other extreme, 
we have this very currently very popular but not very interpretable neural network. So low dimensional interaction models just gives one step beyond this linear model by capturing the pairwise interaction structures among all the main effects. It gives slightly better uh, predictive performance, but still attains very good predictive, uh, very good uh, interpretability. And in this project, we provide a framework that gives uh, in, uh, methods that uh, can uh, get, a get a very computational um, efficient methods to fit this low dimensional interaction model. And everything, uh, all the interactions in this, um, in this slides or in this talk is very genetic, generic in, in, in nature. And actually there are certain types of interactions that are particularly interesting. In particular, biologists really care about the gene environmental interaction. And that is one possible in extension of this current uh, projects where we're, talk, we're trying to uh, set up a framework to do reluctant G by E or gene and environmental interaction modeling, where G, G by E interaction is saying that there are certain interactions between a genetic and an environmental factor that will change, will result in different uh, phenotype. For example, here we have twins that have the, uh, the same genetic information, but they're treated or exposed to different environmental results uh, uh, factors that results in different phenotype. So this model can be written as my response of interest as just some information of genes, some information of the environment, but also the interactions between genes and interactions uh, and environments. This can be uh, modeled uh, very generally as a response that equals to some functions of gene in, uh, information some functions G star of environments information and their pairwise interactions. Motivated by this reluctance principle, we're trying to just, just use the, uh, to focus on the pure G by E interaction, which are those interactions that cannot be well explained by any, any function of just main effect, uh, of just gene uh, effects or environments effects alone. So this is, a ongoing projects that uh, I'm currently working with uh, Professor Daniel Wheaton in our department. All right, uh, and that will conclude my talk for today. Uh, I'd love to talk about any, uh, uh, answer any questions. If you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, for more information, our paper is available online and we have a R package implementing Sprinter. Unfortunately, the name Sprinter is available on, on CREN. So uh, we need to call it another name, so we call it Spring R. All right, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. That's my talk, thank you very much. Okay, thanks Hugo. And so any questions from the audience? You can either like raise your hand or like using the chat box or using the Q&A sections. Okay, uh, well. Well, people are thinking about a question. I, I myself actually have a question. Um, mm -hmm. yes. So I was just thinking that like, how, like in, so if I understand it correctly, the alpha is actually the alpha importance set is actually a more theoretical construct. And in practice, yes. you never need to estimate it, right? You are more yeah. like choosing eta, but this eta kind of give you an implicit correspondence, corresponding a alpha that you're trying to estimate, right? Exactly. So basically in the paper, um, there is like a one-to-one -one correspondence between the eta, which is the actual tuning parameter, and alpha, which is the theoretical tuning parameter that we're using. Okay, so so I, I'm actually I'm also curious about that. In practice, how do you choose eta, or like it would just be something that you more like user specify things, or or do you yes, have any like uh, reference way to to think to choose that? Yeah. So basically, uh, there are two things that we can try here. The first one is there is basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between the value of eta and the number of interactions that we consider mm -hmm. in step two. So uh, when we talk about the number of selected interactions that we want to keep in step two, then there is some uh, standard values of number mm -hmm. of interactions that we we'll want to keep uh, from, for example, the short independent screening paper, which is either n or n over log n, like the, the floor number of that. Uh, which are pretty standard. Another approach is just treat it as a tuning parameter and just we do like a cross validation to select 
the best data adaptive value of the tuning parameter in step two. Okay, great. And I think actually there's a question in the Q&A sections. And I think the question is, I wonder what algorithm is used for screening? Oh, uh, so yeah, so the question is, uh, the, what is the actual algorithm that is used in screening? Well, the, the actual algorithm is just by looking at each interaction, compute, compute the actual car, uh, correlation of this interaction with the residual from step one. And, and then I'm just sorting all of those or, or just look at each ab, ab, actual correlation and see whether it is greater than some tuning parameter eta, which is uh, pre-specified. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I also have another question yes. about, yeah, so, so, that I, I'm, so the, your bag of work model, you're assuming that people have, it's already pre-given or do you have any good way to, to choose that? Like the way, like when you're trying to analyze the trip advisor data, I saw that yeah. you, you have this excellent, like it's superb, these kind of words. So I'm just curious, yeah. how do you kind of construct a library? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so basically the way that I did it was that there's a certain like a, um, um, like a standalone uh, bag of words that I can use. And then I just merge that or I just choose like a historical um, part of uh, the reviews from TripAdvisor. And then I just merge the, the words used that there by parsing the words and, and merge it into this uh, dictionary of words. And that, that gives me like a bag of words. And um, that I, I think that leads to another extension, which is um, there are definitely certain uh, different ways, like uh, in a sentiment analysis, there are a bunch of different ways to construct features or main effects. Uh, and that could also be used uh, in this framework of uh, Sprinter. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? So I'm just just out of curious. I think, do you mm -hmm. think that is it possible to generalize, uh, say, that to generalize your method to like a generalized linear model rather than just a simple linear regression? Because I can kind of see that in, if you are thinking about the trivial advisor data, right? Yes. The rating is between one and five. So exactly. when you are treating it as just a regular <laughs> linear regression, might go go to this overflowing problem. And actually, that might be the reason you are seeing some of these like the like the the, the effect that the positive positive, and then you have to get a negative interaction. So yes. I wonder if it's possible to to generalize to you know just like a GLM models or like that. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, uh, and that's basically why when I talk about this trip advisor data, I was saying this is like an oversimplified model. Uh, because the response is on a scale of one to five and I'm just treating it as a continuous response. Um, that's a good point. And my answer to that is, yes, our methods can be generalized to a uh, generalized linear model. The only difference is that we can still use this um, general notion, notion of reluctance principle. The only difference is that in, in the generalized uh, linear model, um, we need to define this residual differently. Mm -hmm, yes. And currently, we're just thinking about that as just a gradient of uh, uh, of my objective function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a good choice. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. If no other questions, then let's thanks let's thanks Hugo again. Thank you for having me. Yes, and remember that next week we will also have another seminar, so stay tuned and have a nice weekend. Bye. Okay, bye, bye everyone.